So I'm Sean McKenna. I work at IBM Research here in Dallas Town. And I'm going to talk today about trade identity and privacy, try to look at some solutions for that with IoT, AI, and blockchain. Um, in the uh, essence of time, I'm going to go short on the uh, IoT part when we're talking about companies. So if you think about the uh, global economy, and certainly Ireland's economy, in the last 20 to 25 years, global trade is going to be much better. Can everybody hear that? Clear. Yeah? Okay. Um, with the exception of 07, 08, and 09, right? Things have gone very well. But what's happening now is just back in the States for the holidays with my family is uh, you can't get away from two things, right? So I think what we're going to get into is we've become dependent globally on trade. That's not going to go away, but the barriers to that are going to come up in ways that we haven't really seen before, right? So we're going to be doing global trade with um, other impediments, and those remain to be seen exactly what that's uh, going to look like. Uh, with Brexit, every day it brings something different, right? as we saw yesterday. So one of the things that we're doing at IBM is enabling this cross-border global trade. And um, we're doing this on blockchain. I'm going to say a few things about that because I think it's probably one of the most overnight uh, technologies that's come along lately. But if you are in an organization, and that could be a group of people or a group of companies, and you all need read and write privileges to a distributed ledger, blockchain is a solution. If you don't need those things, you may not be. Okay, so look at any blockchain to that perspective. A good example of that is shipping, right? So if I need to get a product from where it's manufactured to where it's grown, to my end suppliers, and that goes to a number of different countries, all the people along that chain put together in a group need to be able to read and write to the same ledger to make sure that those kids are moving along. So we teamed up with Maersk uh, to do this about a year ago. We put this together in August of last year. Uh, this became a joint, a joint venture called Trade Lens. And we've got about, I think even now, over 100 organizations that are part of that and making global trade move faster and more efficiently. Now, one thing I'm going to point out here and we'll come back to is this is really focused on the paperwork of the trade, okay? Customs declarations, bills of lading, uh, tariffs, payments, things like that. And that's really where blockchain has uh, shown the most value so far. But things are changing. All right, so just a little bit of blockchain 101. This still confuses a lot of people, and so I always go through this public versus private chains. If you look at a uh, public chain, we're thinking about Bitcoin, we have a couple different things going on there. Number one, anybody can get on that chain, but we don't know who they are, right? Your identity is generally hidden behind some suit, some avatar, whatever your user is. Right? So we can view everything that happens in Bitcoin on the blockchain. Although we have no idea who's behind those transactions or who's making those happen. We talk about a private blockchain, and this is really where businesses use blockchain. You have a group of people who've come together, just like that uh, supply chain that I showed you, that all want to work together to achieve a common goal, get the goods from the producer and manufacturer into the market. Okay, so now you're only part of that organization if your identity is known and it's been authenticated, and the other members want you to be part of that organization. Okay. If you watched uh, Meet the Parents, right? Robert De Niro's looking at the uh, fiance of his daughter. You're not in the circle of trust. Okay. If you're in a private blockchain, you are in the circle of trust. People know who you are. Okay. Now the other part though is, even though I'm in that circle of trust, I have this common goal. That doesn't mean I want everybody in that circle to know every transaction that I've done. Okay. So there will become no longer viewable by all, but a number of rules uh, that make different transactions viewable by different members. If you're shipping goods across the world, the idea that the customs uh, authorities would have to know everything about what you paid to uh, buy those goods or store those goods is much more than the case. Right? So you can divide that blockchain and that network up into different pieces. All right, different flavors of privacy. 
simple picture in public. Everybody uh, behind their pseudonyms gets in and sees everything in a private blockchain that's limited to that group. And it can be further limited, in this case, green or white votes, uh, to a subset of that group that needs to understand that specific transaction. And we can do that a couple different ways, and IBM is uh, hyperledger, it's our favorite blockchain, which is an open source uh, solution. Okay, um, one of the ways that we do this is some, through something called zero knowledge proofs. These are, are you may be hearing about these now. I'm going to just do the simple example. We've got a friend who's colorblind. We've got two dolls, one's red, one's blue. And basically, your friend um, wants you to verify that those balls are different because to her, they look exactly the same. You want to do that, but you don't want to give her any knowledge. You don't want to tell her which ball is red, which ball is blue. You're the prover. You come up with this way, you say, hold these behind your back. You can't do it with the microphone. Bring them back out. If I do that, I'm not going to say the red one's in your left hand, but I'm going to say you switch them, or you did not switch them. By doing that, she knows that I know there's a difference between them if I get it right. But I haven't told her anything about which one is red and which one is blue. Okay, so this is the idea of a zero knowledge proof. We're giving her zero knowledge, but we're proving that we know something about that. And if you think about this in a trade situation, um, it's kind of three levels of privacy. I've got three banks here that are trading different uh, digital assets, uh, loyalty points, uh, some manufacturing asset, uh, water canaries, and other ones. Between those three banks, this is what the ledger would look like and everybody can see it in public. Okay? Full privacy, you can't see anything. You have no idea who transferred which thing to what. We use this zero knowledge proof idea. We've got uh, transfers between banks, and in this case, I've been given uh, access to what Bank B has done, and I'm going to make it on the supply chain. I can see exactly what Bank B has done, who they transferred from it to, but I don't know anything about their account. I don't know how much money or loyalty points they have at this point. Okay, and I don't know anything about the other banks either. So as an auditor, maybe I'm an auditor as part of that number, this zero knowledge uh, approach lets me audit your books but not um, reveal any uh, additional knowledge about their situation. Okay, so that's another way to think about privacy. So, when you, when you come to manufacturing, you think about blockchains. As I said before, all the focus so far has been on reducing paperwork, working with digital assets, contracts, financial instruments, uh, digital media, it could be sound, video. What, what the challenge is, is coming to now is how do we use that in a way to look at physical assets? If I want to ship something like a diamond, across the globe, how do I know that it is that diamond that I started with that ends up at the end being sold to somebody? Okay? So they've been blockchains have been focused on digital assets. We're working now, and I'll show you in just a moment, on physical assets. And when I think about this, this takes a couple different things. We need some unique, immutable, unchangeable property of that physical asset. Uh, that we can assess, and we want to be able to assess that and look at that in a non-destructive way. You have to tear apart whatever you're shipping just to prove that it is what it was, that doesn't help us. So, non-destructive way of doing that. If I had a diamond, and the diamond industry is totally hated, 40 or 50 years, then every diamond is unique. I ought to be able to put it in a stand and shine a light at it at a specific angle and get some spectrum out of that diamond that's different than any other. Take a picture of that, put that on the blockchain so everyone in the organization or the network can see this is the pattern that diamond produced, when it was mined, when it was shipped, when it was uh, sold, all the way through. And that gives me a chain uh, that uh, proves the uh, source of the identity of that diamond. Okay, so how does this come in? I'm going to show you a little bit in just a moment. But we're, we're thinking about borders as, as barriers, uh, and this comes on, I think, the example here being the land bridge uh, through the UK, I think something about half of the exports out of Ireland and the rest of the world go through that land bridge right now. That shuts down in three months, less than three months. Uh, we don't have the capacity to move 
things on the ferries uh, over there, and we're going to be moving goods through this land bridge, not through the EU anymore, but through a different, uh, different, set of, uh, different situation. So one of the uh, issues that comes up when you want to get around that border is this idea of counterfeit goods. Probably uh, one of the older uh, professions. If you look at the uh, business of counterfeit goods right now, uh, this was projected back in 2015, but on the order of about $1.8 trillion. With prescription drugs and electronics being by far the largest uh, source of counterfeit goods. So the question is, could we start to look at this and uh, use blockchain to look at these physical assets and cut down on the number of uh, counterfeits? So what I'm going to show you now, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, there's a few examples here, olive oil. Uh, we hear about extra virgin olive oil on the top end. Probably about 50% of that world is, uh, well, is, is called extra virgin and is not. Huge, huge amount of uh, business done with you know, less, less quality. Uh, pharmaceuticals, counterfeit trades are about 600 billion. Fashion is around 450 billion. Uh, hardware is going to be So, I'm going to show you a demo uh, here, just a little video how this works. You can find some of this on YouTube. The version I'm going to show you is a little uh, less polished, shall we say. Um, okay, we're going. So this is a really uh, simple solution. We're using three things. We're using a, a smartphone, just like all of us have. We're using a, a bit of um, AI on top of that, artificial intelligence, and then we're sticking on uh, blockchain. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so what my colleague is doing here is taking a vial that's been with extra virgin olive oil. We've got one of those cheap uh, magnifying glasses that you can buy for your cell phone on top of that. We're sticking it on there, and then we've written some software to capture that image and look at a number of different qualities from that image. What you're going to see here is just the, uh, the uh, color spectrum from that. And this is the, uh, the reference case. This is actual extra virgin top end olive oil. And it's color spectrum looking at frequency of different colors across there it looks something like this. Now we're going to replace that with another vial should look, it looks to me exactly the same as the last one. Okay, but this is adultery. Uh, um, this is not the top end stuff anymore. This is being passed off as counterfeit. You can see the big shift in the uh, color spectrum, right? Um, those two, you know, they look exactly the same to us. It's extremely different uh, when looked at through this magnifying glass and the color spectrum. Uh, so again, this is a fairly uh, simple test to look at a, in this case, counterfeit product, uh, of which there's a huge amount of uh, counterfeiting going on. So that's what the uh, cheaper one. Now, the software runs on the cell phone. You can, you can put uh, the uh, magnifying glass on there, or you can use something a little uh, beefier. And we're going to show you here in just the next example. Uh, this is still buying one of these 25 euro uh, lenses that clips on a cell phone, but this one's microscopic. I think we get about 60 to 100 uh, times magnification on the next one. And it's coming up right now. So what we're looking at here is a pharmaceutical. This is ibuprofen. And it's a little hard once you have that very small focal area to get it aligned, but there you go. Take a look not just at the color of that, but at the pattern that you see on the surface of that pill. Okay? So that's the, uh, that's the actual one. This is the, the true uh, ibuprofen pill at this point. And we're going to capture that image. There's its color spectrum again. Got, got a little mixed up. There's the target one. And you can see those are not the same, right? We've got two different peaks in the color spectrum here and one up here. Again, not a match, and that is a counterfeit uh, pill on the second one. 
Now, the other piece of this that I'm not showing you here is those surfaces, if you looked at it, were quite different. Okay? At a microscopic level, if you're counterfeiting something, it's really, really difficult to get the exact same finish on that part or on that pharmaceutical that the actual manufacturer would have. Using uh, these AI algorithms that we have within here, picking up that difference in the texture is a uh, fairly simple thing to do. Okay, so we're going to move on and just finish up. A little bit on the AI that went into there. We were looking at images. We used something called the convolutional neural network to do that. Anyone here doing AI? Thinking about it? Okay. So, so <laughs> it's not a secret, but the way AI works is it works really well when you have lots of data. Okay? So we have tons of images. We can classify what's breast cancer tumor and what's not in a slide. This is something we've done at IBM. But it takes a lot of labeled images, somebody, a doctor saying this is breast cancer, this is not, to be able to train that algorithm to learn the difference. Okay? What makes us really nice with counterfeit data is we can get infinite numbers of images of the real product. Because if you work with that manufacturer, they're going to say, here's my thing, take all the images you want of whatever microscope you want, these are all the real deal. And now our problem becomes even easier, because all we have to say is, this is not the real deal. We, we don't have to identify what that counterfeit is, we don't care. We just want to say, this is not made by the manufacturer, it does the real thing. Okay? Um, so, what is not generally a lot easier to determine than what it is. Okay? And that makes this a, a nice solution. Once we have those images, that color spectrum, that uh, characteristic of the surface, those go onto the blockchain. Anyone can check those from the source, the manufacturer, all the way through this final sale to say, this looks like the real deal. This is not kind of feel that way. Okay, so then just to uh, summarize, talk briefly about uh, blockchains, public, public versus private. Again, this isn't Bitcoin. If you're in a private blockchain, you're in with a group of people that you want to do business with. Okay? And you're in there and you know who they are, their identity is authenticated, and that doesn't mean you have to share everything about your business with them. So it's to uh, not do that. And then I talked about what we're calling Verifier, which I showed you the beauty of. Um, and this is getting at this challenge of tracking physical assets on a blockchain. We have a way to non destructively test uh, some property that manufactured good. That's the best thing, and I think there's a lot of opportunities to use artificial intelligence here to make that work. Now, just yesterday, uh, you may or may not have seen this, we signed a deal with a Ford Motor Company, LG Chemicals, and a number of other um, groups, uh, mining groups, to look at the sourcing of cobalt, where it's mined all the way through the manufacturer uh, with Ford. Cobalt is huge, uh, becoming even more important in batteries. I mean, there's probably an ounce of it in that laptop right there. If you have an electric vehicle, you probably have about 10 kilograms of cobalt. We're expecting prices on cobalt to quadruple in the next 10 to 15 years. So the problem is it's not all sourced in the way we would like. We've got the mining practices are not always the way we do. So making sure that cobalt came from a mine that's approved all the getting it all the way through the manufacturing process is where we use technology here. Okay, so I'm going to end there and be happy to take uh, any questions.